you very much, Daniel, for inviting me to speak here. Um, I've had the great privilege of working in a tiny laboratory in Oxford, the Dunn School of Laboratory, which inspired me to, uh, to get into the pharmaceutical industry. I worked for a great man called Peter Cook, whose whole life was devoted to understanding what were the machinery inside the nucleus. What was it that took one meter of DNA and packed it down into that tiny nucleus? And my thesis was on the thermodynamics of DNA structure. And then one day, he said to me, you know, this is really important because of patients. And I said, what do you mean? I mean, I'd never seen a patient. I'd come from Africa. My whole life had been looking at animals and seeing people live, die, but I'd never thought about patients. He said, yes, patients. And he brought in to see us at the lab a woman with xeroderma pigmentosa. How many of you know what xeroderma pigmentosa is? It's a terrible disease. Your DNA repair mechanisms are broken. You go into the sun, you get skin cancers all the time. At that moment, a light went off. And I said, I'm going to spend the rest of my life becoming a doctor, trying to fix this. Well, I did become a doctor. I went to Cambridge, did liver transplant. Never once thought that I would actually go into the pharmaceutical industry, because remember this, and this is relevant to this talk. The pharmaceutical industry was the dark side. Jack, where are you? leaving academia, leaving medicine, going to the dark side. Well, we fast forward now 25 years later, a little bit longer than that. I've seen, I still practice medicine when I can, mostly in Africa. None of you want to be touched by me. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> but people who really need doctors are in those parts of the world. And that's where I go. However, fast forward 25 years, and I've had the great privilege in the last couple, three, four years, to produce medicines that touch one in six of all the pills, well, produce one in six of all the pills that are consumed in America, one in six of all the pills that are consumed in uh, Great Britain, and I hope we've done a lot of good. What I want to talk about today is the future of pharma. One thing's for sure, every time you make a prediction about the future of pharma, it's wrong. Great pharmaceutical executives in 1970s said, no more antibiotics. We don't need them. We have discovered everything that's possible. Everything is complete. We heard about the biome, the microbiome. I think we've only just started to understand about uh, how and what you can do with the enormous diversity of flora and flora, flora and fauna inside your body. Another example of that was prior to 1986, 1996 and 2006, the idea that you would recruit T cells to attack cancer, ridiculous. All sorts of crazy ideas wasn't part of pharma's business. One acquisition, 2009, of a company called Medrex, and their thinking, and their thinking, results in an absolute stampede across the pharmaceutical industry to create immunological agents that attack cancer. And we've heard a lot more about it here. So today, what I want to do is just to, first of all, set, set your expectations to what they really should be. No predictions. I will give you a hint of what I think we need to tackle in order to really take this industry, the pharmaceutical industry, the biotech industry, and hit the future in the way that all of us deserve, our children deserve, and indeed, the rest of the world deserves. Because make no mistake, make no mistake, it is the medicines that we are producing in this country, in the Western world, and many parts of the world where people really think about patients that are going to make the difference. Finding medicines is a privilege. Treating patients, you have to have a covenant with those patients. And I fundamentally believe Healthcare is part of democracy. So today, let me start with a little bit of history, small piece of history, and it'll tell you a little bit about the dark side. Actually, American pharmaceutical industry really started in 1937, when Merck, against the backdrop of the terrible dark wave that was sweeping over Europe, said, we're developing research labs. A great, bold move here in the United States. By the 1950s, you had a lot of phenomenological-type medicines, 
experimental, we'll try it out, does it work? And I saw, saw that wonderful example of heroin uh, yesterday. Actually, we don't use that any longer, although in Great Britain we did up until very recently and still do for pain relief. By the 1980s, a whole new concept had arrived. This is due to black and the idea that the beta blocker could actually attack a receptor. Small molecules became king. The pharmaceutical companies reveled in this. In fact, they forgot about research. No pharmaceutical company was headed by a physician or a scientist. They were headed by businessmen. And if you look at that period of time between when I was a student going into uh, the pharmaceutical industry and thinking about it, here you had a situation where you had businessmen running the industry. This is important because what they did was they all did the same things and then they raised the price, 10% every year. They didn't think about the patient, they just raised the price. Now there's a lot of people out there in my industry who are gonna be very angry at me when they hear me say this, but it's true and they know it. The 1990s, suddenly, you had some of the greatest leaders of all. You had the leaders of Merck again stepping up. People who were magnificent, they said, we want to develop medicines. At the same time, unbeknownst to them, you had a an organization actually here in San Francisco saying, we have this new thing called biotechnology, and we're gonna develop whole new sets of, uh, of medicines. What happened during that period of time, the pharmaceuticals reputation went down the drain. The biotech industry started to edge up. And by, the 19, by 2010, I can tell you right now, there is actually no difference in terms of the R&D. Pharmaceutical companies having scorned, scorned the, uh, the efforts of the biotechnology industry suddenly woke up to the fact that this was the future and you had to meld the deep understanding of the biotechnology industry with what they were doing and absorb it. They've never quite managed to do that and I'm going to show you why it's important that they haven't done it. Back in the 80s, go, let's go back again. The thinking was like this, and by the way, it remained very similar to this in the pharmaceutical industry for years, that you had a population of patients. Laura's examples of trials, targeted trials, just would never have been contemplated, wouldn't have been contemplated. You simply took the same diagnosis, a population of people, you threw the same drug at them, and you hoped that in fact something good would come out of it, but you charged them all the same price. And in fact, there were four outcomes, only one of which was beneficial to the patient, only one of which, and a minority of which, actually had an impact. Now, that type of thinking about how you treated patients was prevalent. And the idea that you might target a small subset of the patients to treat them and treat them 100% effectively was considered anathema, anathema. Occasionally, you'd see brilliance break through occasionally, but not often, the vast majority of the pharmaceutical industry during the 1980s, 1990s, and even into the early uh, 2000s were thinking this way. Now, the beautiful thing that we've seen here over the last few days is just how extraordinary, how remarkable we have a change has occurred. We're now able to really target the individual You've heard this word, personalized medicine, many, many times. I actually firmly believe it's here. Diagnosis, treatment with the right medicines is the right way to go. And we're struggling with it, we're tackling it, but the concept is embedded. It is going to happen. Every time a new medicine is now invented, people think about what's the diagnostic tool that I should be using with it. And this is critical, absolutely critical. So all of these factors, family history, health history, metabolism, behavior, pharmacogenomics, all critical to defining the individual. And it's had massive impact. The idea that you've moved from this mass treatment to targeted therapies is here. It's embedded in the deepest parts of all the companies. They haven't yet understood how to do it, and I'll show you why in a moment, but the bottom line is it's there. And here you have this charming child, cystic fibrosis, First time last year, we launch a drug that actually treats cystic fibrosis, actually treats the disease itself, the sodium channels. 
We haven't yet, and that's Vertex who did that. I really commend them for that. It was a brave, brave thing for them to do, and I hope that they're very successful on it. The top right, spinal muscular atrophy, not yet there, but just a little north of here. Isis is working with Biogen, looking at some very targeted nucleic acid treat uh, therapies, which hopefully will have a massive impact. And I really, again, think that this is the kind of thinking that will have a, an effect on multiple diseases. And it is just the beginning, because once you understand treating at the nucleic acid level, then you can contemplate doing this for multiple disorders. But this doesn't come quickly. In fact, it comes very slowly. Most of the drugs that I've just spoken to you about, for example, uh, the one that I mentioned for cystic fibrosis, was started many years ago. The drug was initiated, then you had approval where that little green blop is, and then finally you get the drug marketed. So it takes the span of time to develop a drug is massive. But the rewards are substantial. If you can read this slide, and it's not mine, I want to thank Mark Schoenbaum, an analyst of the, actually the top ranked analyst today in the pharmaceutical industry. This is his slide. He shows you basically the medicines in the US sales and how many have actually, how many sales there were after each quarter. And if you look carefully, there's one that goes up and then goes down. And that is Incevic. Incevic was the first treatment by Vertex, again, for HCV. And there was a revolution. Interference, which they were used before, this was going to be the biggest thing since you know what. Within 18 months, it's off the market. Gilead, in the meantime, bravely, and I must say, in a way that very few people can really appreciate, a $35 billion company suddenly decides to spend $11 billion on one phase two molecule. One in four shot of making it. That's what I call a bet. I have to say, the two Johns at the head of that company really understood how to turn a card. But what happened then was Savaldi. That's on the left. A remarkable impact on their sales. And just to put a fine point, you'll notice there's a few blue dots there with no name. Actually, the name is there. That's the iPhone 1 in comparison. The iPhone 6, of course, is a little bit off this chart. But it's not just that the medicines that they've invented, these targeted medicines, are in fact something that is meaningful, uh, is, generates revenue. It's that it's meaningful. Olivia is a child of cystic fibrosis. This is her statement. Read it. It's very important. Breathe. Live. Love. Laugh. Olivia Jones. That is about a child with cystic fibrosis. Now, what privilege, what better privilege is there to find a medicine to help that child, to connect with that child? But what's interesting about this, no pharmaceutical company knew about these kind of imagery. They didn't go to the social media to understand what the patients were doing, but the patients knew themselves. The need is there. We need to find ways of addressing massive populations. The pharmaceutical industry can provide those ways. What you see here is just what's happening with Alzheimer's. By the time 2050 comes here, we heard yesterday the impact on this country of Alzheimer's will be massive. Are we equipped to deal with it? Against the backdrop of this, that type of disease burden is the immense spending that's going on. As you can see here, the federal spending on healthcare, the percentage of the gross national product that is actually going to be devoted to healthcare has gone radically up, radically up. Sometimes we look at this and say, this is all impossible. But I want to give you an inverse perspective on this, something slightly different, just to push back on that concept that the spending is just spending and spending. This is not like buying a bunch of weapons and sending it abroad and having it destroyed there. Not at all. This is about investing in people, investing in their health. This is about how you actually invest your money, save lives, and generate our economy. And what you see here, cancer treatments, and amazingly, it's one of the largest segments of treatments, was, spends about 1% of the healthcare dollars since 1990, roughly, approximately. 
But if you then calculate how many years of life have been saved, you're really talking about 43 million patient years of life. And how much did that translate into economic activity is immense. So when you think about this cost equation, think also about what you're doing to the society. Remember, I did say to you, healthcare is about democracy, and I firmly believe that. Also think about the impact on the society, not just morally, but also on its productivity when you actually find the right medicines. Now you're sitting here and you're a very special group. How many of you are actually in the pharmaceutical industry? About 10%, roughly. I think 50% of this audience should be the pharmaceutical biotech industry. Why? Because of the wonderful things that you've been speaking about. The revolution that you've been speaking about over the last two days, and we'll speak about tomorrow, is one that they need to hear. They need to interact. There are no senior chief executive officers in any pharmaceutical company that I know of that understand the revolution that you're going through. Their kids do. I can guarantee you their kids do. They don't. Not in their consciousness. And this is very important to understand. They have lots of meetings, lots of discussions about it, but are they here? And we've just shown you they're not. And why is it important that they should be here? You've shown it, you know this, but I want you to understand that the reason that they should know it is that every single aspect of the value chain in the pharmaceutical industry is about to be disrupted, every single one. From discovery, where Craig, with his wonderfully eloquent discussion yesterday about the power of the sequencing that he's going to do, I believe it was 100,000 uh, genomes per, per week, right? Is it week? Yeah. Going, and the cost of that just rocketing downwards and the amount of information that's going to flow from that about patients, about their needs, through to patient adherence. Every segment is something that we will touch on and we will need to understand and we will need to incorporate into our businesses. And what's most important that has been discussed over the last day is just how central the individual is. I call it the patient. But here, as you see it, what is it that we're going to see? Why is it that the pharmaceutical needs to understand this? If you look at all of those things that impact the patient today and are impacted by the technologies that you have been developing and that you are developing, there's something striking, something quite remarkable. Not only well, are you going to be able to measure everything that's going on you? Not only of all the exponential technologies that you're talking about going to give you insight into your body and your living, your health, but something else remarkable. The day before that patient takes a medicine, a new medicine, the pharmaceutical company knows more about it than the patient. It's going to be the case. The day afterwards, when they release that medicine, the patient in the crowd, the doctors are going to know much more about that medicine than the pharmaceutical company knows. And when that happens, at that moment, the company will fail or succeed because it must be prepared to address all the flood of information that's going to come back out of the technologies to understand their own business, their own medicines. This is something few of them even begin to contemplate Few of the companies will ever internalize that idea because it's very scary. It's very scary to them. Con just, con just consider, you've spent 800, 900 million dollars to launch your drug. You know everything about it, you're confident, you've gone through the FDA. The day afterwards, within hours, Kaiser, John, where are you? Will be telling you exactly what that drug does because now it's not being tested in 5,000 people, it's 50,000, it's 5 million. And all of the changes that you expect will surface very quickly. So exponential medicine has a profound impact, not just on every aspect that you've talked about in the medicine itself, but also on the industry. And I would say to you that one of the most important aspects of all of this is 
that we don't understand it in our industry. And that's why, I, again, Daniel, I make a plea to you, address the pharmaceutical industry, bring them here, have them educated, they need to be educated. Now, this industry is extraordinary. Just to give you some scale, last year, $51 billion was spent by research in the industry. Approximately 800,000 people are employed. About 4 million other people are employed residually in this country alone, in this industry. It is replete with names that go back years. Go back years. Many of them accumulated by bit by bit by bit by having acquired other companies. And one thing they do very well is they copy each other. They always copy each other. When one does something, the others do it as well. It's very funny, there's waves of it. So when there was one PD-1 that came out of Bristol, suddenly there was a PD-1, for those of you who don't know what a PD-1 is, it's part of the, immune, the new th therapies that have been used for oncology. It's a it basically takes the brakes off the T cells and allows them to attack cancers. But bottom line is, when there was one, Bristol Myers Squibb, then there was Smith Klein Beecham, then there was GSK, and then there was onward, 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 onward. When one company buys another company, you can guarantee this is going to happen very quickly with somebody else. Guarantee. It's an absolute certainty. But what's very interesting about that is that when you look at their research, over 70% of all of the targets that they currently research on are the same. So go back to that $51 billion. Ask yourself the question, what are they really doing? Shouldn't they be thinking more about how to collaborate, cooperate, find the best targets with you, and working out how they should really be attacking patients and dealing with them? Now, I want to address something critical. I'm here, a few of my colleagues are here. You understand so much more about the digital world. How do we work together? Because we must. There's a language barrier. I talk molecules, I talk clinical trials, etc., etc. Many of the doctors in this room bridge this language gap. It's a wonderful opportunity for doctors to really try and put themselves right where they should be under, between the medicine, the patient, and the, doc, and, the phys, and the pharmaceutical company. Marvelous opportunity. But language is a massive barrier. Digital language is not pharmaceutical language, and it intimidates intimidates many of the people in pharmaceutical companies. Secondly, here's an example, innovation. Innovation in the pharmaceutical companies is a nine to 15 year process. In fact, somebody will say, I today want that market addressed in the most remarkable way, and 15 years hence, maybe a medicine will turn up that hits the idea that was back here. Now, this is a bit odd. A couple things about this, and we'll go into the specifics of it in a minute. But most pharmaceutical executives don't live to see or stay in that company to see the drug emerge. So what is their ownership on this? Think about that. Somebody says share price. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> but it's a critical point. 15 years from beginning to end. Very difficult to find people to actually follow that. However, in the digital world, innovation is months. And it's an extraordinarily iter iterative process. And just as passionate as are the scientists in the discovery phase, who I, they go in every day and they fail. Every day they fail. Just as passionate as those people are, well-meaning, they really want to find a medicine. So you find the same thing at the front end of the digital uh, innovation. So there's a great deal of commonality in the way people think and desire and want to do things. There's only one difference. The ones at the front of a pharmaceutical company won't know that they've failed until 15 years later. In the innovation world, they know real fast. So the ecology, ecology of innovation in these two industries are very different. The biospheres need to merge. One of the most important things that I think one should understand in this trying to bridge the differences between them 
is that the industry of the pharmaceutical that live, live in is one which is so highly regulated as to make every move one that has to be precision and linear. On the other hand, the innovation in, in the digital world is an open system. It's one which is completely hurly-burly. It's one where the immense creativity that any one person has in one day can be translated into something else the next day without a third party intervening. Without a third party intervening. Multiple markets can be addressed. Very different type of thinking. So as you think about your pharmaceutical colleagues who are the recipients of much of what you'll do, please understand that. This gulf is fundamental. Understanding the words innovation here does not mean the same thing innovation there. This is critical. And unless the industries and the people participating understand that, there will be no ability to translate easily. Second, people. What's great about the people in the digital world is they are free thinking. They consider moving from one business to the next like this. It's not even a matter of thought. Got a great idea, let's go with you. Highly entrepreneurial, highly entrepreneurial. Don't have the same thinking in the pharmaceutical industry. Thirdly, structure. I know you say, oh gosh, structure. Trust me, I, I've run a company of about 50,000 people. When you run 50,000 people, there's a structure there somewhere. Not a great structure, in, well, let's not go there. But nevertheless, every company has a structure and it's siloed and it has linear processes and then you have rank here and you have 13 people down below and you keep on talking about delayering, trying to motivate everybody into doing something. This structure is extraordinarily inhibiting and the bigger you get, the more structure you have. And think about this, you have in Sanofi 125,000 people, okay? So it makes my glass company feel kind of small. If you go to J&J, uh, &J, I think it's close to 200,000 people. Mind you, the market cap is 300 billion, but that's a different story. Fact of the matter is structure is important. Why? Because when you try and bring somebody out of that organization to talk to one of your organizations, this is what they see. That's a whole different type of animal. The digital startup is something which is quite remarkable. It's robust, it's, it moves. There aren't layers. And you move around. And if you want to help your colleague that's doing something interesting, you go and do it. Because that's what you should be doing. Pharmaceutical companies have a tendency of taking really smart people, putting them in an organization, and suddenly they're dumb. In a digital organization, you have really smart people, put them together, and if they're not smart, they're out. It's a whole different type of thinking. So there's a lot of challenges. I don't want to go through them. It's sort of boring. But I want you to know one thing. Speed and flexibility, critical. Risk averse and pharma, risk taking in digital. Culture, we have to change. And execution, boy, execution, which is the only thing. It doesn't matter what purpose your company has, what structure you have in the strategy to make that that, uh, that purpose come to life, what mission you set to the people, or in fact the operations that you try and do, it all comes down to executing. And there is really important to understand how success, how success is contingent on rapid iterative development. And in the pharmaceutical companies, they know this. So, I didn't spell this incorrectly, by the way. I had a French speller, and there's a a-P-P-A-R-T, and then I thought, that's very nice. Are we two different, are we from Venus and you from Mars, or the other way around? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. Fundamental change has arrived. You have an opportunity to work with a pharmaceutical company, and they with you. We need to understand some critical aspects of this. We need to help the industry drive change. And one of the things I've always thought about the industry is that deeply respectful of some of the great minds that are within it, who actually can make change. Now, I think if you harness those minds of some of the people in this audience, the future of pharma or the future of discovering medicines is very, very, very optimistic. I'm very optimistic about it. 
So I do believe we're intertwined, deeply and fundamentally. All of the doctors in this audience, all of those who look after patients understand it, because it is a covenant from the pharmaceutical company producing that medicine to giving it a pill through somebody's mouth, because you changed that person's life at that moment. And that chain of people, from developing that medicine all the way through to really giving that patient something, are critical to understand, and they are part of a process. And I would like to see much more integration occur. And it's happening. It's just, just hints of this are happening in large pharma companies. Down below, or on the left-hand corner, you know you're seeing some technology integration. Great step forward by Novartis in their ophthalmology group to think about it and to tie up with the diabetes group and say, wow, we should be working together and, and look at this Google uh, lens. Incredibly brave of Google at the same time to say, we're just going to make a lens. They forgot about the FDA, they forgot about a couple other things, but nevertheless, it was a good move. Really applaud it. Enhanced care delivery. You really need to enhance this. Fundamentally, pharma companies are profoundly thinking about this. How can you keep patients, uh, how can you get them to take their pills quickly and keep them taking their pills? For example, just to give you a statistic, in one of the companies that I know, their idea, they know factory at the end of every year, 50% of those people taking their prescriptions stop taking it. Very bad for the patients, very bad for the companies, and in balance, these pills are necessary because the patients end up in hospital. So adherence, how you enhance care, critical. And the commercial model, it's going to change. You can't have hundreds and hundreds of patients with hundreds and hundreds of salespeople. It's going to be a digital platform, a platform which links the doctor, the patient, the, uh, the pharmaceutical company, the pharmacies. I think there are immense opportunities, immense opportunities. There are billions of dollars of opportunities awaiting our thought process. You have to start to think about how you can address them. For me, the one that I'm most excited about is linking the diagnostics with therapeutics, because you will be able to target that patient better and better and better and find out exactly where you can impact their disease. Second one, Laura addressed it, clinical trials. Pick the right segment of the population to test your drugs on. It's nuts to be trying it on broad populations. This will make a fundamental economic difference. And I believe not only economic difference, it'll have a profound impact on those companies who want to succeed. The competitive advantage of the company that takes the jump and heads into this area will be the company that well, and that welds this properly together will be the company that emerges at the end. The pharmaceutical industry is not going away. It is going to morph, but it will develop, the ecology will change. So, but the question is, who's going to champion this change? Remember what I said to you, pharmaceutical companies will do what the others have done? They need to be brave. The leadership of each pharmaceutical company today needs to stand back and ask the question, and then how can they actually embark on the voyage of getting into this industry, and then have to step forward. But I will assure you that when one does, you will see a stampede. So, do I think that who will win? Do I really think that the pharmaceutical companies will do this? Is it the big that will do it or the small? These are all biotech companies. Look at them. Market cap of Regeneron, $35 billion. Regeneron, there's a link with Merck. Remember I said the great leader of Merck? Roy Vagelis, one of the greatest pharmaceutical scientists all, an MD, goes to Regeneron, a tiny company. And what happens? 20 years later, he's created a huge company. I think, if you look at these biotech companies, I think that resident in this body of large companies now, although very innovative companies, are the seeds of the future industry. And I believe it's all about those who dare because it's not necessarily big that succeeds. It's when you get together and work together and work with others that you can be immensely powerful. There's a great phrase, 
who dares wins. In this case, absolutely. So the future is bright, I think, if we can link. A transformation is coming, and it's a transformation which will be both relevant and important. And most important for me, I really want us to be respected again. I don't want to go back to my boss saying, you've gone to the dark side. I want to be, my children to be proud of me that I'm in an industry that's changing lives. Thank you very much.